Hello, this is Anne de Geest, and it's July the 22nd, 2024. Um, unfortunately, I have to do another COVID update. Uh, we all wish the virus has gone away, but unfortunately, there's a new wave. And I just want to give you the latest update uh, since my, my video six months ago. So as you can see in this graphic there, we're having 780,000 new COVID infection per day. And we are on par to basically have a peak at the same level that we had for the uh, Omicron and some of the prior winter peak. So we need to basically be careful. So what's the good, the bad and the ugly I'm going to cover? Uh, the good news is the long COVID risk has dropped from 10% when you were unvaccinated with the original Wuhan virus to 3.5% if you stay actively vaccinated. Um, uh, Paclovid and metformin are still working in case you get infected. The bad news is that we're still getting 780,000 new infections per day, which is now driving back ER and hospitalization. Waste water, which is the only way we can keep track of infection, is very high. We'll talk about that. And multiple reinfection has long-term mobility consequences, even if you don't live long, long COVID. The ugly side is up to 20 million Americans have long COVID and there is no treatment. We're still adding at the rate we're going in 800,000 new long COVID patients per month. That is a lot of people who may have several years of, of pain and suffering ahead of them. Uh, the NIH research on long COVID is very slow progress. Uh, and there's three years of data showing long COVID sequela, especially for hospital patients. So we're going to go over some of this data. So let's see what's going on. Uh, viral activity is way up, especially on the West Coast. Um, it's, it's kind of, as I said, on its way back to a major peak. Uh, if you look on this graphic there, you can see in purple is very high. So the whole West Coast is basically extremely hot as far as the amount of viral activity that people find in wastewater. Uh, to give you an idea, there is this great uh, website called iowacovid19tracker.org where you can look and not only in Iowa, but pretty much in every state. And you can see in the San Francisco Bay Area there, the very high is the purple one. You know, it's pretty much uh, all over the Bay Area is high or very high. So we are extremely at risk here in the Bay Area. Um, and this is due to this new mutation called KP3. It's hard to keep track of them, but KP3 is the new variant. It's extremely infectious and also is able to avoid antibodies. So as a result of that, the positivity rate is 12.6%. That's extremely high. What that means is that if you go into a room with 13 people, one of them is at risk of being infectious. So you still need to be careful in being in a situation there where there's high density of people around you in poor circulation room. So just, just use common judgment there. As a result of that, emergency room have been steadily going back up, you know, as people, especially the elderly or people who are immunocompromised, end up having difficulty there. I have been inundated by phone calls of people who never had COVID before who are getting it, and they really uh, seem to have some unpleasant symptoms for a couple of weeks. So this is not just the flu. As you can see, you know, the biggest populated states in the U.S. are all very high, Hawaii in particular, especially with people traveling. Uh, from all over the states uh, are having a peak. Texas, Florida, and California, all very high peaks. So, quick update on long COVID. Around 5% of the U.S. population has not developed long COVID. And the good news uh, is that you can see from the upper graphic that the risk originally with the virus was around 10% uh, on the average uh, for people who are unvaccinated. And then as things developed, the vaccination really provide an amazing protection there. You can see from the Delta virus, it went from 9.5% to 5.3%. And now the studies we're in is 3.5% of people are vaccinated. But keep in mind that if your vaccine was over six to nine months ago, you are equivalent to unvaccinated, i.e. your risk is 7.7%, which is extremely high uh, for the consequences of having long COVID. What's worrisome is that with the existing wave we are having, even at 3.5%, we're still creating 800,000 new COVID patients per month, which is really worrisome. So uh, the vaccination is really providing some protection there, but you have to stay vaccinated. 
So the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine finally got together and they finally put together a definition of long COVID. Everybody had different definitions, so hopefully now we can all be uh, aligned. Uh, it's pretty much for people who still have symptoms after three months. Uh, there's 200 types of symptoms, so there's a long list of those sim symptoms there. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the latest clinical update. So it's estimated up to 20 million people in the U.S. have long COVID. The best protection is to have antibodies from prior infection or from uh, being vaccinated in the last six months. The top symptoms are the brain fog. Uh, and unfortunately, you only see that we see now in MRI and other type of imaging some permanent or at least significant change that are visible uh, in the brain size and cognitive function. Uh, another key symptom is what's called pulse exer exertional malaise. That means you exercise like a normal level of activity and you absolutely crash after those activities for several days of recovery there. So these people cannot have normal exercise activity. Another key symptom then was called POTS, which is as you're sitting and you try to get up, you normally you, 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 your system will automatically adjust heart rate and blood pressure. In this case, it does not. So they get rapid heartbeat and dizziness. Uh, what's worrisome is that now we've seen an increase of neuropsychiatric issues in long COVID. And that's because you're going to see the immune system is low, abnormally low. And as a result of that, some of these dormant virus like Guillain-Barre syndromes are now emerging uh, because the immune system can no longer control it. Also, a lot of issues with cognitive deficit, insomnia, anxiety disorder, you can see this long list there. This study was done on 10 million uh, South Korean and 12 million Japanese, so it's a very huge data set. Another worrisome thing is some people have been getting better with long COVID after a couple of years, and what they've discovered is that if you get another COVID infection, or even a flu infection, you can have a flare-up and long COVID may come back. So this is something that's still in the body. So treatment right now, there is no cure. Uh, it's a combination of rest, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, uh, managing your exercise and your work and your lung function, and uh, trying to make sure you avoid social isolation and depression. Uh, there are certain populations at higher risk, people who have had repeated COVID infection, people who have asthma or allergic retinitis, People with a history of concussion, migraine, and minor autonomic symptoms there. So some people are at higher risk than others. Unfortunately, the NIH got a billion dollars with a B from the government. And honestly, it is so disappointing. I cannot say this publicly when I think about it. So pretty much a waste of tax money per year. Um, so uh, what are some of the studies that have come from other places? So there's a NIH recovery program that has now a data of 14,000 adults that people are using for research purposes. There's a study from Wuhan on three-year follow-up, and what they've shown is 54% of the patient had at least one persistent symptoms after three years, and uh, the symptoms were more common if they got reinfected. There's another big uh, study from Nature Medicine that just came out that on 138,000 people, and what they can show in this graphic is that people who are hospitalized, which is the red line, uh, have a significantly higher mortality rate than people who are non-hospitalized. And so what's pretty clear is that if you were hospitalized there, you're significantly uh, a worse long-term problem with long COVID than if you were just uh, staying at home. So what are some of the sequelae? Uh, these are for non-hospitalized, a lot of issue with neurologic, mental, pulmonary, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, you can see uh, at one year or two years, and it, it does improve at, at three years, but that may be because we don't have all the data yet, as you can see. On non-hospitalized patient there, you can see that the, some of the results last longer there, and they're kind of, you know, also still on the mental and cardiovascular side. Big, big difference between hospitalized versus non-hospitalized. Hospitalized is in red. The PASC is post-acute uh, sequela from COVID. And a kind of significant differences uh, based on the severity if people were hospitalized. Uh, again, uh, pulmonary is leading the charge. Uh, again, red is hospitalized. Uh, coagulation, which is blood clots that has you know, stroke and pulmonary embolism risk, fatigue, cardiovascular, kidney. It's a really long list of, of pretty much every organ in the body being affected. 
Uh, interestingly enough, there is a neurologist report to the, on long COVID on, from Lancet that just came out. And it's unfortunately, it looks like the COVID is going to be a risk factor for increasing the odds of developing Alzheimer. Uh, it's estimated that it could increase by 1.48x. Um, and, and, and so that's a cumulative risk over, for life. So if you have a 10% risk, now you have a 15% risk if you do the math. And 10% risk is for people who have, let's say, one uh, uh, APOE4 combination, uh, APOE3, E3, which is the average population is around 8 to 9%. Inflammation, inflammation in patients with COVID-19 has shown prolonged or inflammation, and this is something that's pretty clear that this is a virus that stays in the body for a long period of time. We'll see this. And antiviral therapy is really considered a critical there. That's why um, Paxlovid, uh, which is an antiviral, you have a window of a couple of days to take there. It's really important if you have a, a moderate as, as infection there. So brain fog, what they've shown now from UCSF study that just came out is that there's a huge inflammatory biomarkers all over the place that are activated and that provide kind of a train wreck uh, in the body and in the brain in particular. And uh, Lancet just came up with another study recently at uh, two years that show MRI abnormalities so it was to be seen in the images of the brain uh, in the cognitive region of the brain, which this explains the brain fog and, and some of the drop in in cognitive function on, on the um, um, in instruments that the doctors are using there. In addition to that, a lot of neurological and psychiatric symptoms are still there. So uh, if you don't get long COVID, you still need to be aware that uh, there could be a risk for long-term change. It turns out the virus persists chronically in the body and they've shown at two years that they find it in the gut, the lung, and the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, it's a two new technology, one from UCSF, where they use radioactive type T cells with an immuno PET scan, and they saw that in particular with long COVID patients there that they could still see the virus in all these body organs. MRE researchers found another one, again looking at long COVID patients, they're using another technology for looking at circulating plasma blasts and looking at antibodies. And what they saw is a really um, a drastic increase in reactivation of this dormant virus, you know, the Epstein-Barr virus, the Cytomega, Lavaris, you know, and the herpes symptoms there. So clearly it shows uh, a neuroinflammation and a drop of the autoimmune system, which has consequences with other diseases. Uh, another study showed a reduction of the immune system at 10 months after a COVID injury, uh, infection there. Uh, this is just not for long COVID, but for all patients. Reinfection, of the, therefore, is a higher cumulative risk of complication for heart, lung, and brain. Uh, this is a paper that came out uh, like six months ago that really showed that if, if you're in green is your first infection, in orange is the second infection, and in purple is the third infection that is a, a drastic increase, especially at the third infection, for having a longer type of complication for lung and heart type of, of, of medical issues there and also neurological disorder. So it's not the flu. If you get reinfected multiple times, you know, be aware you may have some long-term consequence, you know, uh, and so, so it's not just about long COVID, it's multiple reinfection. So how to live with COVID? Just be aware, still wear your N95 in uh, indoor, very crowded area with poor ventilation, especially in the airplane as you're boarding and in crowded airports. You know, the airplanes have improved their filtration there, but the airports have not. Uh, just be aware that every hour uh, in an airplane increase uh, the chance of infection by 53%. So, so for very long flight, you know, you may still want to consider, you know, to maybe wear uh, the mask, you know, during part of the flight. Uh, check your local wastewater surveillance for upcoming search. We're in the middle of it. Uh, stay current on your vaccination. Unfortunately, this this mutations there uh, makes makes it hard to keep your antibody up to screen. So pretty much as a rule of thumb, if you ever had uh, a vaccine for the last six to nine months, you need to get a reboot if you're planning to go on a vacation on a boat or something like that, where there's going to be high density. In addition to that, keeping up to date on vaccination decreased long COVID risk by 36%, so that's quite significant. And we're going to be uh, expecting some new uh, uh, mRNA vaccine with the KP2 uh, mutations there by the fall, but nothing is, is announced yet. If you get reinfected, avoid to avoid getting long COVID, still get Paxlovid, uh, avoid exertion while infected. Build your immune system for four to four, four to eight weeks. Avoid strenuous cardiac exercise. Give you a chance for your body to clear the virus. Remember, the virus 
if you don't clear that's why you know i think it evolves into long covid there so it's really important that it's not about you know testing negative it's the fact that the virus is still in your body for several months and if you don't do that then you end up with this virus in your body for maybe up to two years as we just saw there protect yourself paxlovid still works uh, and data over and over again showing low risk of mortality in ICU admission there. It's hard to get it outside the US. So if you plan to travel and you think you're at risk there, you know, try to get maybe a box and travel with it ahead, you know, uh, during your trip. Uh, I put some of the website to find pharmacy locator and, and also how to check for co-medication. There are certain drugs that you should not take as you're taking Paxlovid. There's a risk of rebound, but a, a recent paper has shown it's not necessarily a rebound. Uh, due to the medication, but it's due to the level of the uh, immune system response and ever, different people will have different response of the immune system there. Metformin has shown to be also an effective antiviral. There was a randomized trial that showed a 40% lower hospitalization and also a decrease of long COVID risk. I've put the, the medication protocol there. Of course, you need, you need to talk to a doctor, make sure this is appropriate for you, but just be aware there's that chance to, to decrease the, the amount of viral load. Uh, this is the data on metformin. You can see it's very clear cut uh, that there was a drastic improvement um, of, of decreasing the risk of long COVID and complications. So uh, a reminder that if you had a recent infection of COVID there, you should not have another vaccine for at least 60 to 90 days. And that's because the body will respond uh, and, and not generate antibodies like you normally would with a vaccine, but it will think it's kind of the same virus that just you're recovering from. So you really want to see, you know, this increase in the B cells. And, and, and you can see from the graphic there that if you infect it and then boost it, you don't get the same amount of antibody creation and protection there. So you want to wait uh, for at least 60 to 90 days is the recommendation I've heard. Alas, uh, a no, uh, note of wisdom is that uh, if you are in a very crowded area, if you hold your breath for five seconds there, that's the most dangerous period where somebody was very close to you. Uh, but be aware if somebody's coughing without a mask, uh, the particles can go as far as two meters and there's wind, of course, it's much lower than that. So just use common sense, move to the side opposite the wind. Uh, maybe I hold my breath for five seconds, somebody's a bit too close to you and you're suspicious. And, you know, kind of keep a little bit of your distance and try to be outdoor if you can. So, uh, so I wish you a wonderful summer. Uh, please post uh, this to friends of yours. There is a new wave. I wish we could go back to our life, but the virus has a different view on this. And, and please support this, this network there. Uh, I'm not a doctor. This is just to help you make an informed decision. Have a wonderful summer.